Chapter 9 of Bob's A Girl Detective. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Bob's A Girl Detective by Grace May North. Chapter 9 A Hurried Lunch. Fourth Avenue having been reached, Miss Wiggin darted into a corner delicatessen store. What will you have for your lunch? She turned to ask of her companion. I'm going to get five cents worth of hot macaroni and a dill pickle. Double the order, Bob said, and then she added to the man who stood behind the counter, I'll also take two ham sandwiches and two chocolate eclairs. Oh, Miss Doolittle, isn't that too much for you to spend at noon? This anxiously from pale, starved-looking little Miss Wiggin. At the Van der Griff table there had always been many courses with a butler to serve, and in her heedless, thoughtless way, Bobs had supposed that everyone, everywhere, had enough to eat. It was a queer little smile that she turned toward her new friend, as she replied, This being our first lunch together, let's have a spread. Then she paid the entire bill, which came to forty cents. No, she assured the protesting Nell Wiggin, I won't offer to treat every day. After this we'll go Dutch, honest we will. Now, lead the way. Again in the thronged street, little Miss Wiggin turned with an apology. Maybe I oughtn't to have asked you to come to my room. Probably you're used to something better. Don't you believe it, Bobs replied cheerily. I live in the shabbiest kind of a dump. She did not add that she had not as yet resided on New York's east side for more than twenty-four hours, at the longest, and that prior to that her home on Long Island had been palatial. She was eager to know how girls who had never had a chance were forced to live. Miss Wiggin was descending rather rickety steps below the street level. "'Is your room in the basement?' Bobs asked, trying to keep from her voice the shock that this revelation brought to her. No wonder there were no roses in the wan cheeks of little Miss Wiggin. Yes, was the reply. The caretakers of the building all live in the basements, you know, and Mrs. O'Malley, the janitor of this one, is a widow with two little boys. She had a room to rent, cheap, and so I took it. Then she led the way through a long, narrow, dark hall. Once Bobs touched the wall, and she drew back shuddering, for the stones were cold and clammy. The little room to which Bobs was admitted opened only on an air shaft, but there was sunlight entering its one small window. Two, there were white curtains and a geranium in bloom on the sill. It's always pleasantest at noon, for that's the only time that the sun reaches my window, the little hostess said, as she hurriedly drew a sewing table out from behind the small cot bed, unfolded it, and placed the lunch thereon. Bobsy's gaze wandered about the room, which was so small that its three pieces of furniture seemed to crowd it. In one corner was a bamboo bookcase on which held the real treasure of Miss Wiggin. Row after row of books in uniform dark red binding. They were all there, Oliver Twist, David Copperfield, Old Curiosity Shop, and the rest of them. Nights would be sort of dismal sitting in here alone if twasn't for those books the little hostess confessed. That's a real good kerosene lamp I have. It makes a bright light. I curl up on the couch as soon as my supper's eaten, and then I forget where I really am, for I go wherever the story takes me. Come, everything is ready, she added, and since fifteen minutes of our time is gone already, we'd better eat without talking. This they did, and Gloria would have said that they gulped their food, but what can one do with but half an hour for nooning? They didn't even stop to put away the table. I'll leave it ready for my supper tonight, Miss Wiggin said, as she fairly flew down the dark, damp basement hall. Five minutes later they were entering the alley door of the antique shop, which had so fine an entrance on Fifth Avenue. May the fate save us, Bobs exclaimed. I do believe we are one minute late. Are we in for an execution or dismissal? but that one minute had evidently escaped the watchful eye of Miss Peerwinkle, for, when Nell Wiggin and Roberta entered the shop, they saw the portly Mr. Queerwitz pacing up and down, and in tragic tones he was exclaiming, "'Gone! Gone! I should have locked it up, but I didn't think anyone else knew the value of it.' Then, wheeling around, he demanded of Bobs, 
"'What good are you, anyway, in the book department? "'One of the rarest books I possess was stolen this morning, "'right beneath your eyes, and—' "'Little Nell Wiggin, usually so timid, stepped forward and said, "'It must have happened while we were out at lunch. "'It couldn't have been while we were here, "'for nobody at all went down to the books.' "'Mr. Queerwitz paid no more attention to the words of little Miss Wiggin "'than he would at that moment to the buzzing of a fly. "'Do little, well named, I should say,' he remarked scathingly. "'How Roberta wished that she had chosen a busier-sounding name, "'but the deed was done. "'One couldn't be changing one's name every few hours, but—' "'Her reverie was interrupted by, "'What have you to say for yourself?' "'Nothing,' was the honest reply. "'You are discharged,' came the ultimatum. "'Bobs was almost glad. "'Very well, Mr. Queerwitz,' she replied, and turning, "'she walked briskly toward the cloakroom. "'When Bobs returned from the cloakroom, "'having donned her hat and jacket, "'she was informed that Mr. Queerwitz had just driven away, "'but that he hadn't said where he was going. "'Bobs believed that he was going to report her uselessness "'as a detective to her employer, James Jewett. "'Oh, well, let him go.' Perhaps, after all, she had made a mistake in her choice of a profession. As she was passing, she heard the older women talking. Miss Harriet Dingley was saying, Now I come to think of it, just after the girls went out to lunch, I did see a man come in, but I thought he was looking at China. The head lady shot a none too pleasant glance at the other clerk, as she said coldly, Well, you aren't giving me any information. Didn't I watch every move he made like a cat watches a mouse hole? "'Just tell me that.' "'Oh, yes, Miss Peerwinkle, I'm not criticising anything you did. "'But you remember when a boy ran by, shouting fire, "'we did go to the door to see where the fire was, "'and a minute later the man went out, and... "'He went empty-handed,' the headwoman said, self-defendingly. "'I know he did. "'Now please don't think I'm criticising you, "'but when he went out, I noticed that he was a hunchback, "'and I'm certain that he didn't have a hump when he came in.' "'We'll not discuss the matter further,' was said in a tone of finality, "'as Miss Peerwinkle walked away with an air of offended dignity. "'Bobs looked about for Nell, to whom she wished to say good-bye. "'She was glad that the youngest clerk was beyond the bookshelves, "'as Roberta was curious to know which book had been taken. "'A gap on the top shelf told the story. "'It was a rare old book for which one thousand dollars had been offered "'if its mate could be found.' "'Whoever has taken the book has the other volume. "'I'm detective enough to know that,' Roberta declared. "'Then she turned to find little Miss Wiggin standing at her side, "'looking as sad as though something very precious "'was being taken away from her. "'Impulsively, Bobs held out both hands. "'Don't forget, Nell Wiggin, that you and I are to be friends, "'and what's more, next Sunday morning at ten o'clock sharp, "'I'm coming down to get you and take you to my home for dinner. "'How would you like that?' "'Like it?' The dark eyes in the pale, wan face were like stars. Oh, Miss Doolittle, what it will mean to me! Miss Harriet Dingley did nod when she heard Bob singing out, Goodbye! But Miss Peerwinkle seemed to be as deaf as a statue. I could laugh, Bob said to herself as she joined the throng on Fifth Avenue, if my heart wasn't so full of tears. I don't know as I can stand much more of seeing how the other half lives without having a good cry over it. "'Dickens, the only friend and comforter of that frail little mite of humanity. "'Then, as she turned again toward Avenue A, "'she suddenly remembered the package of detective stories "'for which she had promised to call at the shop "'where there was a spray of lilacs and a much-loved invalid woman. "'I guess I'll give up the detective game,' she thought as she hurried along, "'but I'll enjoy reading the stories just the same.' Half an hour later she had changed her mind, and had decided that she really was a very fine detective indeed. End of chapter 9